This is Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. All talk and all crime, the nation's biggest murders, financial crimes on Wall Street. The facts, the forensics, the inside stories today. And the Connecticut Supreme Court overturns a lower court ruling on defense incompetence that had vacated Michael Skakel's conviction in the Moxley murder case. A vindication for the lead attorney, Mickey Sherman, amidst a potential return to prison for his former client. Mickey Sherman, both nationally renowned and locally acclaimed here in his hometown of Greenwich. He was a lead defense attorney in Kennedy cousin Michael Skakel's trial for the 1975 murder of Martha Moxley when both Skakel and Martha, the victim, were 15 years old. Mickey's known as a celebrity defense attorney. He's been a legal analyst for CBS, uh, CBS, frequent guest on all the major networks, and many appearances on Nancy Grace's show when it was on. He was on with us before on his book, How Can You Defend These People? And I understand he has a new one in his works where we will uh, discuss later. Welcome back, Mickey. Good, Good to be here. Have you. To me, this was a huge uh, case of judicial overreach. And it reminded me of, I don't know if you remember this, but in the Ford administration, Ray Donovan was the Secretary of Labor. When Ray Donovan came out of the courthouse, he just they said, uh, blank, blank, blank. And he's looked at them and said, that's all well and good, but just tell me who I see about getting my reputation back. Yeah, that's right. Did, did, did I get it right? You got it 100% right. Yeah, Took it right out of my mouth, and I thought about you on this. That speaks volumes. It speaks volumes. So you can kind of relate to that now. Totally. How tough was it for you uh, not to be able to talk during this whole period? I remember asking if I could interview, and you said, no, I'm laying low, no interviews. And I said I'd never seen Mickey Sherman and not speaking in the same exactly. sentence. That's, I've been taking that position for 15 years. I didn't. I didn't speak about the case until the starting after the day of the verdict on June seventh, uh, two thousand two. So I just started commenting three days ago when this uh, decision came out because I think it was appropriate and it is appropriate for me to comment on that. Did the closeness of the vote four to three um, surprise you? Did the decision surprise you? Everything surprised me. I just didn't believe that they would overturn another judge's ruling. Bittersweet aspect, though, about Michael's status? It's not even bittersweet. It, it would be bittersweet if I was enjoying the fact that this is all happening. I, I'm, I'm gratified and I'm thankful to the, the public and the uh, lawyers and everyone in town and elsewhere who's, who've been very kind to me and said, hey, good, good job, you've been vindicated. But it's not a vindication. It, it, I still lost the case. Yeah. I mean, people don't understand that in the criminal law world, you don't get credit for trying hard. You don't yeah. get credit for doing a good job. You don't get credit for having a great attitude. You get credit only, only when you win. Bill Parcells used to say that. No medals for trying. That, that's it. That's it. it. It's that's the litmus test. And if if you did a great job, it doesn't mean anything. So I I totally get the fact that people, certainly the uh, Skagels, were upset that uh, that Michael went to jail. And the problem is now that even though I've been, as they say, vindicated. That doesn't move the ball any further to Michael getting out of jail or staying out of jail. And that's that's a, that's a very, not bittersweet, just bitter. Um, the habeas decision in itself was a, seemed like a, a small chance that it could happen. Does he have any pathways left, and should he be back in jail now, having had since the conviction for murder reinstated? Well, I'm not an appellate lawyer, but uh, I would imagine that they'll move pretty quickly for something called reconsideration, which is basically asking for a do-over. Uh, I don't know on what basis they'll use because the case has kind of been litigated uh, ad nauseum. They'll also appeal, I assume, to the uh, United States Supreme Court. But uh, that that's always an uphill battle. But again, again, this was an uphill battle just to get to, to where they got three years ago. So anything is possible in this case. Under normal circumstances, would the person go right back to jail? God only knows. I've never had this situation. Technically, on 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 the papers, that's what should happen. But uh, I think he'll make an argument for uh, a higher bond, and uh, we'll see what the judge says. Do you have, a, uh, at this stage, a who done it kind of thing? You continue to maintain, I assume, that Michael was innocent. Always have, and I always will believe that's the case. Who done it? I think there's a good chance that his brother may have done it. Do I know that for sure? Absolutely not. Could I prove it? No. And I was criticized widely in the, in the habeas uh, action for not proving that uh, Tom Skakel did it. But I'm not the police. Uh, if I had concrete evidence or even tenable evidence, even tenable evidence, I would have uh, acted on it as, as best I could. In fact, I'll ask. We'll talk about that a little bit because one of the uh, one of the, I think the big three habeas issues was that you uh, chose not to use Tommy as a third party That's culpability. Uh, the question is: uh, is first off, um, it was circumstantial, right? And 
the evidence against Tommy was in the Sutton report, which is hearsay and privilege, right? right? So do is there any evidence that you really could have put on showing that Tommy did it without violating that? No, and especially when he told me, when Tommy and his lawyer told me that he would he would invoke the Fifth Amendment. So he wouldn't even open his mouth on, on, on the stand. And then the, the question is, well, how would the jury react to that? Would they see them, that Michael is there uh, uh, fronting for his brother? Would they come to the conclusion that Tommy's involved, but he's helping M- uh, Michael? God only knows. There's just and too it many proves ifs. the motive of jealousy and rage, potentially. Yeah, right? I, always, I always thought that was such, such a bull. Uh, I mean, when, when Judge Kavanowski marshaled the evidence, I mean, I know Judge Kavanowski forever. And he's a terrific guy, right. a wonderful judge. But I was so... Outra- not outraged, I was so upset that he took the time to what they call marshal the evidence, which is basically give, give his scoop as to what could have happened. And they went into this whole jealousy thing. Which, I mean, 15-year-olds don't kill each other out of jealousy. It just doesn't happen. At least not in Belhaver, not in Greenwich, not in Chickahominy. It just doesn't happen. So so you use the uh, tutor as a third-party culpability, cul- culpability uh, option, let's say, call it that. And did you think at the time Tommy was the most likely, and then still use Littleton, or you just didn't know? You didn't know that. Did, did, okay. Did, did, didn't know. Now, to me, and this, I, I know that legally it's probably not kosher, but if the Skakels are paying you, and I, well, they wouldn't really, to me, view it as a win if you got Michael off and got his brother ending up getting convicted. I wouldn't have cared. You wouldn't have cared. So no. that wouldn't have, wouldn't have played into it. Absolutely not. And, and uh, they gave me a free reign. Some people have said to me, "Well, did they oh, tell so. you?" You can't do this. You can't do that. No, they they always. So it's your decision to go, use to, it, to go totally. Tutor. It just wasn't effective. With this, with the tutor yeah. Littleton, you had him confessing to the crime on tape yeah. to his wife. Yeah. You had the police, the, the state attorney's office. You had their, uh, Frank Gar going to Boston to have tape to have his the guy's wife tape him saying that he committed the crime. There was not ample evidence, but there was substantial evidence. And that's why I wanted to use him, as opposed to saying, well, it could have been him, and it might have been him, and it might have been him. They criticized me for just saying one. I was going to ask you the buffet strategy next. Exactly. But, but, but on, on, on the, on the uh, Gar, and I guess Jack Solomon always thought, uh, the investigator, that it was Littleton. But then they kind of it kind of came out that that was sort of coerced, that confession, right? Because he was set up. It was, But he still said some yeah. of the things that they couldn't coerce him with. In other words, in his phoned-up confessions... There was bits of uh, information that, that were not planted there by Gar or by Jack Solomon. But it was phonied up, kind of, so some, 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 some of was, it was some was Now, you weren't aware of that right at the time. No, I, I, no. Yeah, so you were kind of set up yourself on that. Let me ask you this on this uh, on this over judicial overreach. Um, I would have thought that applied to attorneys that didn't do anything, maybe fell asleep, maybe were drunk. Am I wrong well, on that's that? Well, that's, that's one of the main cases in attorney incompetence is there was a guy who was, I think he was charged with murder, and he appealed the case because he lost and claimed that his lawyer slept during the trial at counsel table. Yeah, that and, I can relate to. Is yeah, but, no, no, but here's the problem. The, the, the court in that state over, overruled the defense saying, uh, your conviction stands because we've examined the record, and the lawyer didn't fall asleep at any of the important parts of the trial. Okay. So, the, so that's... So he got off on that? Yeah. Yeah, that's ineffectiveness of counsel. Yeah, that makes no sense to me, The whole yeah. this whole thing. Am I right in this? You could have said the, after the end of the prosecution case, this is circumstantial. You haven't proved that he was tortured in the land, those confessions. The people that we impeached, the guys, they were drug addicts of these guys. I'm not putting on a defense. And wouldn't that have been a legitimate defense? No defense. In other words, you said just just what I said. You haven't proved the case. There's no evidence. Uh, he was in a... He well, was that, in a that would be the final argument, but... You're absolutely right. And someone asked me a couple of days ago, maybe you heard it. I, think, I, I forgot where I said it, but I've said it before. The winning strategy, they asked me what, what, what I would do different in this case, what I would do different. And the only thing that I would do different, I would consider exactly what you just said, and that is not putting on a case. Because by the end of the state's case... I came up with that myself. I'm not a lawyer. There I'm pretty... you go. By the end of the state's case, I, I was sure we won, as was everyone yeah. else in that courtroom. Yeah. So we, I think we lost this case... On the testimony of the family, and I'm not trying to diss the right, family, right. but it just it just came out crappy. So if I had had the uh, the it gov- makes the judicial overreach, the bishop ruling look even more ridiculous that, because I think you could have justified a no defense strategy and I mean a resting strategy. Yeah, after. but who's got the courage, defense lawyer wise, to do that? Oh, I, I agree. I'm you just know, saying that if uh, I had had the uh, 
I can't see the words. I'm really saying that Bishop was off limits with what he did. Well, uh, the last thing I want to do is is, yeah. uh, is saying something negative about Judge Bishop. I still I, w- I, w- I wake up screaming in the morning, uh, okay. in, the, in the evening, uh, as I sat next to his uh, bench for four days. Right, well, on, let's on, go to uh, what you call the buffet table. Yeah. Might you, in retrospect, uh, have tried to throw some stuff on the wall, whether it be Tommy Hasbrook, the caveman theory? That no, no. Um, and the, the, the theories that they had. You know, when you're talking about the two black guys did it. Yes, Al Hasbrook, I mean, yeah. That, that's essentially what it is. I mean, it's, it's like when somebody buys... By the way, it's black, a lynching. Yeah, no, well, but it's 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 just so bogus, yeah. apparently. Then there was a, a, a doctor in uh, California, someplace in California, near L.A., who claimed that he knew something about the case and blah, blah, blah. I flew out there, I met with him. He was in uh, John Moxley's high school class, and he claimed to have knowledge that there was this, that John was a serial killer. So John killed his, his, his sister. That was in Bobby's say, book, by the way. I know that. that yeah, yeah. That's what I'm leading up to. Bobby asked me for all the information about that. I said, are you, are you crazy? I mean, he, they actually put that in as a, a possibility. Yeah, meanwhile, meanwhile the, the information the guy had, I tracked it down. All the people who were killed, they, they figured out the people who killed him. Wasn't it? And John Moxley. I mean, Bobby thinks it has maintained Ken Littleton as a serial killer. Well, right which is at, also nuts. Also, a, after, the, uh, f- after the trial... Bobby wrote a 37-page article in Atlantic Magazine yep. saying that I screwed up because I didn't prove Ken Littleton did it. Right. Then he switched around to make it uh, I screwed up because I didn't prove jo, uh, jo, uh, Alsberg. T- Alsberg or, or, yeah. or Tommy. The yeah. uh, other other theories, which were, there were so many of them, there was the out-of-control Xerox executives who were combing the... Uh, I didn't hear that one. Yeah, the, they, 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 they were uh, going about their business looking for... Mr. Moxley, who was the head of Deloitte Touche, yes. to kill him because they were some business deal they were being uh, unfair about. So they went after his wife instead. I mean, his no, daughter. Sorry, yeah, yeah. But I mean, how did you know uh, uh, back on the cavemen, the the two black guys, Al Hasbrook, that Bobby is? That's now his theory. How did you know that Gitano Bryant, who was the guy that brought this up and said he saw twelve people in Bay, Bell Haven and they went cavemen? How did you? How did you? How do you know that's so bogus? It just just from from personal experience. Plus, it was brought forth by uh, Vito Colucci, uh, who was my investigator, and I just didn't trust that. He was your investigator? Yeah. And you didn't trust him? No. Interesting. I forgot that he came out of uh, of Vito. And um, so do you think Bobby actually believes that this guy did it? Hasbrook. It it depends on which way the wind is blowing. Uh, Let's talk about Bobby for a second. In his book, uh, the chapter on you, he calls you the clown. Um, a media whore, um, that you had an incentive to not spend the money because you needed the money, that, they, that the family paid you up front, mm-hmm. you didn't have a jury expert, um, you didn't look into the caveman thing. What's your response to all that? I would do everything I did before. I think it's all bogus. Uh, as far as paying me, I charge them by the hours. I, only two cases I've ever had in my life here, out of 40-some-odd years, I charged by the hour. I think it was $350, which by Greenwich standards is pretty darn low. Yeah. Uh, and at some point, they they just didn't want to pay any more money, so they said we'll give you a lump sum, and that that became a situation where I only had X amount of dollars to work with, and they felt that that was unethical. Well, if it wasn't I, I didn't create that situation. They did. Uh, but did it cause you not to hire a jury? No, no, no. And, and I, I I could have hired a jury consultants. I I know so many of them from TV and from working. I'm I'm not crazy about them. It's as simple as that. I think it's voodoo. I, I've, I've used them, but I've, I've, it just wasn't the case for it. Let me ask you this, then. You obviously think Bobby is full of bogus theories, and, but you believe Michael's innocent. Yes. How How is that reconciled? Why hasn't Bobby figured out? Uh, well, you know, but this, 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 the, I got the case in 1998. The case went to trial and was finished in 2002. Mm-hmm. And I would see Bobby uh, no times. He came once for an hour and a half in those four years. He's so concerned about his cousin that he showed up once for an hour and a half. And he had no strategy suggestions he for He had you. nothing except criticism for me later on. Okay, so what makes you 100% certain that Michael's innocent? Because and why I, does Bobby have to create all this crap to try and make I don't, it? Well, B- Bobby, I think, feels that if he can create enough uh, dust, it'll it'll whip something up. But that's just not the way it works. I think I don't think I know that Michael's uh, innocent because I know the case. I know the date, the time that the uh, murder was committed because we proved that we're using Dr. Jahemchek, who came up from uh, Houston, 
uh, the dogs barking, which brought in evidence, including even Martin, uh, Dorothy Moxley agreed on the time of the death based on the dogs and stuff. Close to when Tommy not, finished in the bushes. 9.30 to, uh, between 9.30 and 10 o'clock. And then we had the, uh, we, we knew that My- Michael was at the Terrian house, but that, uh, that alibi should have, should have just carried us all the way home. The fact that he was in the back country. Yeah. See, I don't believe he ever went to the back country, but we'll talk about that later. What is, what do you think is the most unfair thing that happened, uh, to Michael either in or out of the courtroom through this whole period? I think when they, when the media, for example, there was a, there was a guy named Greg Coleman who testified. That's, that's the guy that uh, I got to admit that he used uh, heroin. Well, he was on testifying for the grand jury, right? The, and he was making and and, and, the, and he was making stuff up. Uh, nonetheless, he, he he testified that he was there to guard Michael. He walked into a room. Michael was there, and something like two hours went by. Nothing was said. Nothing at all was said, according to this witness. And then finally, the witness said. Michael looked at him and said, I'm going to get away with murder. I'm a Kennedy. And uh, like a total non sequitur. And what's unfair, not that that happened, but that it was reported on the front page of the New York Post, just like that. And I think that was that's a tough headline to, uh, to erase. I don't believe Michael ever said that either in reference no way. to that. It doesn't sound like... Uh, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. Yeah. To me, it's hard to get any attached credibility to a land because of the na- coercive nature of the place. But what does hit me is why was he there? He was not a suspect at the time, really. No, he was, and, and they tried to say that the family sent him to the, yeah, there to hide. That, that he there's, was going to break and they had to two, get him. three dozen kids who were the same background as Michael, affluent people, kids with problems, autis- whether it was autism or uh, uh, S, uh, post-traumatic stress from God knows what, or OCD, any number of problems. They were not hiding there. And I spoke to so many of these kids. I mean, I went around the country speaking to these kids. They're, they're no longer kids. And I, every, to, to every one of them, they, they, they substantiated the fact that Michael did not say these things, and they, they were not put on the stand to say it. If, uh, if Michael did not go to the back country, did he do it? No, I don't think he did it. Even if he did not go to the back country, he, he well, would. even if he didn't, he, he, yeah. he, it's it's just not Michael Skagel. I mean, I got to know him pretty well. In the four years that I worked together with him, we spent a lot of time together. He's a very funny guy, sometimes inappropriate humor, but I'm certainly yeah. no stranger to that. And uh, it's just not his, his thing. I I never saw any violence or threat of violence or anger to. Uh, Anybody on Michael's back. By all accounts, though, he was a highly troubled kid at 13, 14, 15. His mother died, who was the core to the whole family. Right. And um, there was a lot of rage. And, of course, the Sutton Report, as you know, puts his profile and Tommy's as basically uh, amenable to get pulling this kind of a thing off. You see him now, right? He's been sober. He does a lot of good work. Do you, do you feel comfortable that you can assess what he was like at 15 and what might have caused a... Uh, I don't think anyone, a one-time thing like this. I I haven't known him since then, obviously, since the trial. But uh, I don't think the leopards change their spots that much. All right, let's finish off quickly with uh, with Bobby. It's a good point. He said all the whole the, all those years he was there once for an hour and a half. Yeah. Why is he so attached to trying to get Mc, uh, Michael off now? Uh, he needs a form. He needs uh, some place to uh, to uh, make a, a, na- a name for himself. So it's not it's not necessarily Michael related, as it is he's using Michael. Let me tell you the, the one thing that when I when I represented Michael in those four years, there was one thing that Michael told me very often, and that is that there was no love lost between him and Bobby Kennedy. That must have that must have come later their friendship, but uh, during as the run up to the trial, that was the reason of the the. the that Michael was writing a book because he was pissed off at Bobby and some of the other uh, relatives, and he was writing a book. And the name, what's the name of the book? The, the, it has the Kennedy name. In, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the Kennedy Secrets or something yeah, like that. And, it, and in the book, he was dissing everybody, including and especially Bobby. Then all of a sudden, Bobby becomes his champion. Yeah. I asked Bobby, I said, is there any chance that you suddenly fell in love with Michael so that book wouldn't be published? Because uh, it never was. But he, he said that's not true at all. My own theory is that Michael helped him get off drugs. Oh, Michael Bobby, did. Yeah, and the, and Michael so Bobby me, feels um, some sort of yeah. yeah. Michael told me many times he 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 uh, did uh, interventions with him. Yeah, and I think that may be the source of why Bobby 
uh, has this um, thing. I can't explain why it wasn't helping him in court yeah, when, a, when, he, when he could have helped it's, him. It's too little too late. Too little too late. Okay, and we will be back with more. All right, we're back with our guest, uh, former lead Skakel attorney, Mickey Sherman, who's just been vindicated for what looked like a massive judicial overreach uh, that resulted in vacating of Michael Skakel's murder conviction for defense incompetence. Some of these issues raised by Bishop. Uh, a second one, uh, we talked about the third-party culpability, was his Dennis Osorio, and you're not locating him, putting him on, and all that kind of thing. My question is that he apparently testified that when he saw Michael, it was in a different room than they were actually watching right. Monty Python. And um, so is he credible, even if you I, found him? That's the issue. I think when, when they found him, and by the way, don't forget, get, this wasn't the defense who was trying to overturn the verdict. This is the defense in the uh, habeas court. So they can't blame me too much for not finding this guy. They didn't find him either, yeah. or they didn't look for him either. Yeah. So what makes me so bad? But the Supreme Court, though, really addressed it very hard, and they came to the conclusion, as you just said, that we don't even know if he was there. If he was there, there's no evidence to suggest that he saw Michael there, because at various times, all the boys there said publicly or under oath who was there, and they never talked about this other guy, nor did anyone ever say they saw him. And by the way, the Michael testified at the habeas hearing, I believe, that he told you a hundred times about this Osorio guy. I take that Michael's line. I don't want to say Michael's lying, but uh, I don't believe I heard. He, he, I, no, the answer you, is no. You, you, you missed hearing it for 100 times. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, that to me is, uh, is but pretty you know crazy. What? You're trying to be respectful. No respectful. I, I don't blame Michael. I really don't. If I was locked up for a crime I didn't commit, I'd be pretty pissed off, and I would uh, do everything I could to get out of there. And Michael, I think, is probably believes what, what he's saying. Um, did you – it's always bothered me that originally Julie Skakel – and Andrea Shakespeare were pretty adamant that Michael didn't go to the back country, and there's that famous... There's that line, Michael, is that you? Yeah, Michael, is that you? Exactly. Come back here, Michael, or something. Yeah. Um, I guess they've changed their testimony or memories over time, but doesn't that bother you, those, that, that, those two? That was devastating. That was one of the... That was one of the devastating that they thought they, that he didn't go? Devastating that they said to, that, to, the, to, to a jury. that, that it, it was a chink in the armor of the alibi defense, yes, which okay. was such a necessary uh, aspect of the case. What does that mean? In other words, we everything was locked down pretty tight. Right. Michael was at the Tyrian house. Everyone saw him there. He, we, we did the, the, the time of death would fit in. And then all of a sudden, the, the jury is told that, well, maybe he didn't go to the right. Tyrians because somebody, somebody, not necessarily Michael, ran across the lawn. Right. And Julie said, is that you, Michael? I mean, that's such speculation. It should not have had the weight that it carried. You don't feel that Julie was um, trying to uh, affect the case negatively or do something Absolutely against not. Michael. No. That, she, that she was being honest. No. Uh, just that she doesn't know it. You don't think she can... Uh, There's no... None of the kids did anything to poison the case against Michael. They, they, they all stood as one, with the, with the exception, perhaps, of, of uh, Tommy, if, in fact, he was the real culprit. Do you think Tommy did not do enough uh, to offer to help Michael? I don't know if Tommy even came to the ca uh, case or... I think he came one day, one half a day. He went up a day. Do you blame him at all for, for uh, not going all out? Or yeah, you did. If, if one of my siblings was charged with murder, I'd be at the courthouse every day. Um, now you say that you know Michael as you just described, right? Do you feel you know Tommy that way? No, not at all. No. So, Tommy is just because there's it's, you, one of the one of the two guys had to have done it, and you're convinced Michael isn't. So Tommy, that's that's where I you just come believe down that, I, I believe that Michael did, didn't. Do, I believe that Michael did not. Commit the crime. Always have felt that way. And okay. whether or not uh, uh, Tommy did it, don't know. Do you think that Tommy and um, Ken Littleton can claim each other as alibis because of going to watch the French Connection and that puts them both in the same room? Do you buy that timeline? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Because? I just don't know who to believe. I mean, Tommy was kind of a slick uh, character in this thing. And, and Littleton was, uh, what's the word? I, I don't want to be unkind, but uh, he had some serious issues. See, that's another question I have, is that um, I think we could say that Michael is a good person now and not trouble. He was then. 
He was, well, he was, but he was he, highly troubled, Mickey, and he was drinking that night, and he was on drugs that get in night. The, get in the car, go 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 up with, uh, North Street, and lock on any door. Every every family has their problems. Every family yeah, has their yeah. issues. Be they uh, minority, be they members of the Sandwich Club, or working at Bell the Haven Saint, Club, yeah, Bell Haven, or, or working at the St. Rock's Fair. Uh, family misery is not uh, simply some uh, based upon uh, affluence. Yeah, but at the time, and I get your point, especially in Bell Haven, there was a lot of drugs in that era. But at the time, Littleton was not someone that was deemed to be a big problem. You know, the the problems he's had, uh, you know, since then, the, uh, he was arrested in Nantucket by polar issues. But he was considered, I don't think, troubled at that time. And Michael was. Is he the one who climbed the, 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 the tower and screamed on McKennedy? I'm Ken Kennedy. Uh, I, I think so. Yes. Yeah, I, mean, I was, think he, got, he. I think he burglarized him. But those are years after this, yeah. and he he was basically made to be a scapegoat. So you can see it, it obviously. Uh, um, you know, one of the journalists I forgot who it was started their story about Ken Littleton with, on what has to be called the worst first day of work yes, ever. Yeah. I don't remember who said that. And yeah. It's gallows humor because we're yeah. talking about. It is gallows of, humor, but it also uh, there's an air of truth to that. Yeah. Talk about no motive. I don't even. We don't even know if he knew who Martha yeah, Moxley exactly. was. Exactly. Yeah. So that takes him kind of out of it. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Yeah, given the fact that he, he did have these bizarre confessions, he did have bizarre conduct. Uh, Jackson, not Jackson, but Frank Hart tried to prove that he killed everybody within a twelve mile radius up to up the northeast seaboard. Uh, All right. Now the uh, third component of the Bishop thing that carried weight was this failing to call witnesses that impeached Coleman. We've already kind of talked about that. Do you feel that you were um, tough enough on those uh, on those uh, witnesses? There was another witness, I guess, named Jennifer Pease, who who said that Coleman was a good guy, and he you know heard all this Michael murdered with the golf club stuff. Did did you feel you were tough enough on these folks? I've never done better in my life trying a case and cross examining a witness as I did with Greg Coleman. It became a chapter in a book that someone put out uh, about effective cross-examination. I had him not once, I think I had him on the stand three times before he died. And I got him to admit that uh, he uh, he gave mixed, uh, uh, differing stories each time he was, he was put on the, on the witness stand. He had motives to lie. He's, uh, he asked for a reward. He had cases pending. He wanted the state to get him off the cases. They, one time, that Frank R. took him from lunch during lunch to the hospital so he could get hepped up on on methadone and then come back and testify. And that was, I remember I remember it was so vividly that day because it was all announced in court that that's what was happening. I mean, they take they take the, the witness away, and so he comes back later after after he's had the methadone. Dan Abrams, who was with the NBC I think at the time, asked me outside the courthouse in the little press stuff he had. It was the first question out of the box. Was uh, Mickey, which is more effective to cross-examine a witness who's on methadone or a witness who's on heroin? And my response was, "You got both." <laughs> no, my response was very simple. That's like asking me to pick my favorite Menendez brother. <laughs> There's a Menendez brother uh, special on tonight, yeah. I think. By yeah. the way, um, Jerrain Ridge was another one who. Um, who said that Michael made a confession to her at a party or something briefly. Did you take her apart, too? Or? Yeah, I believe I did. You did take her apart. The um, Now, what about the confessions that Michael did make? Um, that he were, didn't make any. Did he make them? He, he wore the sign. I mean, to me, they were, they, those were coercive up there. They weren't even, he wore the sign, at, confront me about why I killed my friend Martha Moxley. Right. Okay, that's not a confession. Well, they're, they're making him wear that while they're beating him up. Right. I mean, that's no confession. So it's coercive. Of, of course. The question is, why were they, why were they doing it? Joe Ritchie is a fellow who owned uh, the program. He had his own ideas about uh, how to deal with troubled kids. Right. He actually grew up in Porchester right down the street here. But remember, and, at this time, uh, Michael has this unassailable alibi. He's in the back country. Yeah. He's not a suspect. Yeah. So Tommy's the 100% suspect. Right. So why, is all these, why do all these confessions come out of this place? Um, which to me would not be legally admissible because the place was nuts, but they were. Do- but for some reason they were hanging this on him, or or he was hanging it on himself. Because there were people like Greg Coleman who read about the murder in uh, tabloids and made up a story. So or- Joe Ritchie then jumps in and says, "We're going to torture him." Exactly. Joe Ritchie was was, was that nasty of a person. Really? I'll, not, I'll never forget the first time I met Joe Ritchie, who is now since deceased. He he wouldn't come to testify before the grand jury. 
but he finally was made to, and he came there with two lawyers. And uh, I kind of hung out there because I wasn't privy to this, but uh, there was no way they could keep me from uh, being there. So I went up to Joe Ritchie and I said, Hi, Joe, I'm Mickey Sherman. I'm representing Michael Skakel. He said, I know you are. And uh, I said, so what are you going to say? And he said to me, I'm going to say that I never heard Michael Skakel uh, confess and no staff member of mine ever heard a confession and that if he had ever confessed, I would uh, I would have heard about it. I go, and that's the truth? And he goes, what the F you care about the truth? That's exactly what he said, except he didn't say F. And that was the last time I spoke to him. Then he went into the grand jury. I don't think he said anything, but he, that was Weird. that was the kind of guy he was. All right, let's talk about it. Now, looking back, uh, so basically all these charges that Bishop made are totally uh, overreach, and everybody kind of feels that, right? I mean, well, I'm not saying that. again. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm not Judge Bishop's favorite lawyer, so. Uh, okay. So uh, let's let's look in retrospect, looking back after action from your perspective now. Did you make some mistakes? And first off, did you go in overconfident? Did you not take it seriously enough? Well, sure hanging around with Dominic Dunn and all that stuff? Dominic Dunn was a friend of mine way before the Skakel trial. Yeah. I knew Dominic Dunn for years. He's a great guy, by the way. Yeah. But, you know, this is a Kennedy thing that you were what were you, you were hanging with the enemy and you were doing Hollywood and all that kind of stuff. I was. I did the, the uh, pilot for Court TV in 1989. They used a trial of mine, the post-traumatic stress Vietnam case. Yeah, one, as, one of the great defenses ever, yeah. ever done, yeah. As, you can say that again. Yeah, it was. <laughs> uh, they used that, you wrote it that way for me, Mickey. Yeah. The, they used that, that case as their first tr- case on court TV, yeah. and then other cr- uh, criminal uh, trial uh, programs uh, came to light. Uh, I was already in the limelight. I had already been on TV a hundred times. Uh, the, the Skakel case wasn't the uh, uh, denouement to let me be a, a, on TV. And it certainly wasn't a situation where I would relax my efforts. If anything, if anything, mm-hmm. I know knowing this case is going to get the attention it's going to get it, knowing that Michael Skakel needs someone to get him out of this mess, I would, I would have and did work much harder or much more uh, innovatively than I ever have Than you life. thought you did. And, and because it was only circumstantial, you weren't overconfident. No. Because you did not think there was any chance he was going to get convicted, right? There's always a chance, but I, I thought that I just think that I just didn't think he would be convicted. And by the way, yeah. in your defense, and I've said this before, all these guys who beat you up after you lost it, everybody thought you were winning until right at the end. Right? And there was There's nobody no expected. question about it. There's nobody no expected. question about it. I mean, I was making excuses for John Bennett because the media people were, were slamming him and they said, Mickey, yeah. well, is this guy such a jerk? I said, No, he's a very competent lawyer. Just give him some time to, to, to recollect himself. Would you have changed strategies at all? Would you have done the buffet table? No. No. You would never have done the buffet table. No. You would never have done Hasbrook. No. And do you think Bobby Kennedy's... Un- un- is- un- unless there was some evidence that I'm not aware of that would, that would, that's effective. I don't believe in, in in letting the jury think that. I'm not sure who did it, but it, could, it was him. Then again, it could have been this guy. I'd rather stay with one theory of the defense... As long as it's competent and it's got some rational evidence and testimony to be backed up. Okay, so in retrospect, would that, should that one person have been Tommy? I, how, how, where have I got the resources to prove that Tommy Skakel committed the crime? Yeah, we talked before about that. Don't forget. You couldn't even put into evidence what does exist. What I did uncover, Jack uh, Solomon, as you know, who was a, one of the uh, yes. investigators who I knew for many years, he uh, uh, had me come to his office one day and he said, uh, did you, anybody show you this? I go, what do you got? An arrest warrant application for Tommy Skakel. Meanwhile, the, the, the state never turned anything like that over to us. So during the trial, while... while uh, oh, really? While, who's on the stand? Uh, either Keegan or... or uh, yeah, it was probably Tom Keegan, uh, who was chief of detectives at the time of the murder. Yeah, Greenwich. Uh, I asked him in the middle of other... I asked him a bunch of just routine questions and then very uh, routinely as well said... And when did you first bring the uh, state's attorney a uh, arrest warrant application for Tommy Skakel? To which the uh, judge goes, you mean Michael Skakel? I go, no, Your Honor, I mean Tommy Skakel. He goes, what are you talking about? I said, this state's attorney was given an arrest warrant signed by two detectives of the Greenwich Police Department saying that this guy didn't do the crime, that it was done by Tommy Skakel. And all hell broke loose in the courtroom. Uh, How do you know that? Uh, did you make a motion for to see it? We made three motions to see any w- warrants that were either signed or unsigned uh, to be shown to us as pre-trial discovery. And it was never shown? Never shown to us. And the judge said, did you, did you know that uh, the warrant was for Tom? 
I said, yes. He said, well, then why didn't you put the request for Tom Skakel? I said, because I wanted, to, I wanted the jury to see if these guys were going to turn it over or not. I did that for a fact. And he was, he was unhappy about it. But you know what? By the afternoon, they had sent Chris Moreno digging in the files, or Frank Garrow probably had it in the trunk of his car. God only knows. <laughs> they produced the warrant. Let me ask you about uh, on Tommy. You did, I think you said this, that um, you met with Tommy and his lawyer, Manny Margolis, right. right? And they said they were going to plead the fifth if you tried to put him on, right? That's correct. But did he answer questions uh, while you were there? Uh, in other words, were you allowed to ask him anything you not wanted? Much. Not, not much. Not much, okay. Because he wasn't going to testify in court. No. But he, but Ma- he was. Manny did he kept, say, I didn't do it because of X, Y, and Z? He didn't. We never even got that far. Ma- Ma- Manny uh, you didn't get that kept, far. kept a very close watch. And what was interesting, you got to remember, I got this case through Manny Margolis. Yes. Yeah. I mean, who was not like a big friend of mine. We we had no professional right. relationship. But did that, give, did that give you any pressure that, well, I can't go after Tommy, then not that's the his client? Not in the slightest. Not in the slightest. Really? Not in the slightest. And he didn't threaten you in any way? No. Saying, don't. No. All right. What about, the, uh, as we finish up the mistakes, uh, it, um, um, the closing, you know, I only went to two days of that, uh, and one of them was, was the day you did your close. And you made that statement, he didn't do it. And he doesn't know who did it. Right. That that even rubbed me as it just didn't feel right to say it, to say it like that. Am I? Were you too glib? No. No. I'm me. I have my own style, whether That's you like you it or not. It's the way I talk. The uh, so you wouldn't have you would basically you 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 wouldn't have changed much. I right? really wouldn't have, which is uh, I know surprising. Which is this surprising? People. Yeah. The only thing that if I had the the the, uh, the courage not to put on a case, that may have been a game changer. But I wouldn't have had the courage. I mean, who, who's not going to put on a case in that situation? Let's finish up uh, as on Game Changer. This decision, how has it changed the game for you? We'll find out over the next uh, few months and see. Uh, uh, What's on your agenda? You got a new book, right? That you're working on, or almost done? Almost done. What's it on? Are you? Could you say or? Yeah, it's it's, it's about going to jail. Oh, in the prior, the uh, tax evasion case. Yeah, yeah, tax payment case. Yeah, well, we've talked about that before. You really, uh, you you don't make excuses for it, and you say, and you and you owned up to it, and you and it's changed your life, right? I, I've always owned up to it. I mean, it, it's, yeah. it, it's not a situation of stealing money nor tax evasion. It's declaring every dime but not paying on time. Right. And I, I'm a lawyer. I should know better. People say, well, they 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 uh, they treat they, they make they bad want, accountants, maybe. Yeah. They, they, they 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 want to make an example out of you. So they they should have made an example, and they, and they, I deserve to have that happen. But uh, the, the the town's been uh, very very kind to me. But to answer your question over 20 minutes ago, what's going to happen? Um, I expect to go back to practicing law as I have been for the last umpteen years. And if clients walk through the door, they walk through the door. If they don't, they don't. We'll be back with Mickey Sherman, whose defense of the Skakel murder trial has just been vindicated by the Connecticut Supreme Court. This is Jim Campbell, host of Forensic Talk. Tune into this station on Monday evenings at 6 p.m. for deep dives into the biggest crime stories today. Unsolved murders, financial crimes, penetrating questions. I'm John I. Newsy, producer of Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. Each week, you'll hear in-depth interviews. Whether it's Bobby Kennedy Jr. on his claims his cousin Michael Skakel is innocent of the Moxley murder, or a brutally honest conversation with Kathleen Willey, one of the women alleging sexual assault in the Clinton Oval Office, or the first interview after prison with an insider trader from the Raj Rajaratnam biggest insider trading scandal in Wall Street history. That's Monday night at 6 p.m. We'll bring you the facts, the forensic, both sides of the story, from insider trading to crimes of passion. Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell is brought to you by Park City Productions. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow us on Instagram. That's Park City Productions 06604. He's the architect of the Skagel defense that was considered incompetence by a lower court ruling in Connecticut, just vindicated on a Supreme Court appeal overturning that result. He's speaking out now for the first time, Mickey Sherman. Are you going to do try and do celebrity stuff again? Pro- well, high profile stuff? Uh, I, they they do have a um, my my first book and the second book have been optioned for a TV series. 
by uh, Barry Levinson and uh, uh, which would be what about a lawyer or a... it's kind of about me just about you it's it's I think the, the who's going to play Mickey Sherman the, the verbiage is, <laughs> is inspired by me you know who wanted to play me which is really funny is before he died Jim Gandolfini who's going to play you yeah you're he, better looking than him well he just he, he was Tony <laughs> Tony Soprano could, could get past it. then they sent me out to L A to meet with uh, Jim Belushi and he along he and I got along real well but he took, wound up taking a different series. But uh, Barry's still in the process of putting this together, and uh, we'll you see have no happens. recommendations, or um, uh, no? He, he, Play he, yourself? No, I'll, I'll. He put me in one of his movies as a uh, talking head lawyer. Is that right? Yeah. How did you? How did you, uh, how did you keep your your self confidence, your belief in yourself, your morale during this whole period? Just kind of put put my head down and, and do the job. It's as simple as that. Not get. Uh, uh, I, I, as Vito said, I, Vito said I went Hollywood. Bobby said I was I was a media whore. Yeah, I I had been doing those shows since they were invented. Long before. Yeah, yeah. and they they were a help to me because it allowed me to be friendly with a great many people who I used as uh, as sources of. Uh, information. Yeah, and he told me you had a great deal of respect for Nancy Grace because when you came out of prison and everything, she treated you like you were Mickey Sherman she, again. She, she didn't. She you know, emailed me uh, yeah. every week while I was there. Same thing with Ashley Banfield. The the media aspect. It's something that you, sh- you really sh- can't take too seriously, and I think the judge, uh, Judge Bishop, was pissed off that I did kind of take it not seriously, not not the trial, but the the, the media stuff. The media stuff. I think they they played a tape of a uh, speech which I had given about twenty times around the country, called um, "Handling the Media in a High Profile Case," and a lot of it was just funny stuff, very funny stuff, and I could see the smoke coming out of Judge uh, Bishop's ears. But um, let's finish up then on, on the uh, two victims of this thing. Um, Michael Skiggle's done 11 years, I think, out of 20 or whatever. Yeah. He's done good works and all that stuff. Do you think that um, they should call it and say, you know, time served? Uh, or if he, if he made an admission, that would, if he was guilty. But I, is, I, should he get something like that? or should he? Get... I think he, they should walk, walk out in front of the courthouse and say, enough is enough. Yeah. And not not to give him time served because that would require him to uh, plead guilty. I don't think he's going to plead guilty, even if they offer him time time served. So he would stay uh, for nine more years instead of pleading guilty. If Michael Skakel has that much uh, tenacity okay. and belief in himself, I, again, I don't speak for him. I, I've spoken to, with him in fourteen right. years, but uh, Is that right? In fourteen years? Well, since not, since two thousand two, almost more than wow. that. Wow, I didn't but, play, I didn't put that together. But you think? That, um, that we should just say, okay, let, enough is enough. Let's I, think, just... I, I think they should. It's like uh, I was telling someone else. In 1970, I was in, I was working in uh, New Haven in the courts while I was in law school, and I watched the Bobby Seale trial, where Bobby Seale, the Black Panther, yes. was accused of torturing and murdering a guy named Alex Rackley, who was a uh, informant. And the defense attorney was Charles Gary, kind of a left-wing lawyer from San Francisco, the, the prosecutor was Arnold Markle, who was the shining star of the prosecutors here in Connecticut, and the judge was a judge named Harold Mulvey. And for the entire summer, the, every every building was boarded up, and they had mounted police everywhere. They expected riots, and they tried the case to an end. They did great jobs every each, each side, and uh, it was a hung jury. And then the, so the defense attorney, as we always do, say, well, instead of a re- retrial, may the case be dismissed. And that's never granted. Well, this judge, Judge Mulvey, said, "You know something? This this town has seen this this trial now for like three months, it, and we're in a siege at this point. The state's attorney put on an excellent case; they couldn't have done better. You did uh, an excellent defense; couldn't have been better. You all took your best shots. I'm dismissing this case right now." And judge, this this case fits this for four oh, and just add forty years to yeah. it. Yeah, because that'll be my final thing. The other victim is always Mrs. Moxley. Does she ever get closure out of this thing? I don't imagine. I've always thought closure is just a, a a stupid term, because no no parent no parent ever gets closure on a murder. On a murder, they may they may find out more information, but every time they make a deal with some serial killer, and and make him a deal because he's identified where the bodies were, and to give the parents closure, I just think that's such a misnomer. It's of no effect. But there's nobody who holds it together more or is more courageous and and kind than Dorothy Moxley. 
And by the way, you even got criticized for that. At the, oh, yeah, yeah. Right, when you said that at least she's getting some closure from Michael's thing. I did. And, and they, uh, that was so, what, totally misinterpreted, right, by the... Uh, yeah. By the... Uh, I guess well, she used to get hollered at when she would come in the courtroom every day. She would get hollered at by John Benedict or Chris Morano saying, you can't kiss Mickey Sherman hello. That's <laughs> <laughs> a true story. And she, she, she said, I like him. And they say, he's not, you can't do that. It was, yeah. it was very funny. John Moxley's a high character guy, too. Totally, to- yeah. totally. Yeah. So as yeah. you were saying before, to be called the, uh, uh, I'm really happy for you about you getting your reputation back. Although, again, you're good like Ray Donovan. You may not find the exact department that can, uh, exactly. can do it. But you'll work on it, I, I think. And uh I won't. I'll just be me. Just be I'm, 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 I'm yeah. not changing. Them. Well, an injustice was done to you, put it that way. And uh, hopefully it's worked its way out. And, um, and hopefully this – will this case ever be put to bed? Not in our lifetime. Yeah, that's what that's what I think it's uh, – which is kind of a sad thing for the Moxley family at least. Yeah. And maybe even for uh, for Michael. But, totally uh, for Michael. But um, – it is what it is. Thanks, Mickey. Always great to see you. And Pleasure. I guess I'm going to see you on TV next as uh, whoever's playing you. And If that gets sold, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do the circuit with everybody now. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Pleasure.